Hello and welcome to Rusty Water Towers, the podcast in search of faith and hope in rural life and ministry. I'm your host, Jonathan Lemaster Smith, or as folks often call me, Dr. J. Each episode of the podcast, I talk with a guest about their experience in rural life and ministry as we search through stories, examples, and images of creative faith and hope that I believe are latent in rural communities. My guest today is Amber Laffey. Amber is a licensed local pastor in the United Methodist Church, hopefully soon a provisional commissioned deacon in the United Methodist Church, and she serves in the Dakotas Conference of the United Methodist Church. And she serves a congregation of about 40 people and also serves as the conference secretary. She currently lives in a small town in South Dakota with her husband, four kids, and an obnoxious cockapoo named MacGyver. Amber is also a former student of mine. She's just graduated with her Master of Divinity, so congratulations for that. But first, before we get started with uh, talking with Amber, each week we go over a, I offer up a country music recommendation about rural life. And since I know that Amber is a big fan of 90s country, I've chosen Alan Jackson's Chattahoochee. This song, this song holds a weird memory for me because I remember in the fifth grade not being able to pronounce it and my teacher correcting me. And I don't know that she was necessarily shaming me. But the way she said it made me feel really bad for not knowing the hard-to-pronounce name of a river in a state that I did not live in, just because I'd heard the song once on the radio. But moving on, regardless, it's a great song. And this is, you know, I love a song about place, especially place that we grow up with, that connects with us and, and guides us. And particularly, this song really does seem to help the singer grow up as part of his life. It's, he sings, uh, it's Alan Jackson, he sings, Way down yonder on the Chattahoochee, it gets hotter than a hoochie-coochie. We laid rubber on the Georgia asphalt. We got a little crazy, but we never got caught. Down by the river on a Friday night, pyramid of cans in the pale moonlight. Talking about cars and dreaming about women, never had a plan, just a living for the minute. Yeah, way down yonder on the Chattahoochee, never knew how much that muddy water meant to me. But I learned how to swim, and I learned who I was. A lot about living, and a little about love. The places we have in our lives that grew up alongside of us are so important. Whether it's the Chattahoochee River, the dirt road that you'd ride bikes down, the old church with the parking lot you'd park in, the high school football field, or wherever that might be. It's also important to note these places are often where the singer felt most free to be, just to live for the minute, he sings. The song continues, When we fogged up the windows in my old Chevy, I was willing, but she wasn't ready. So I settled for a burger and a grape snowed cone. I dropped her off early, but I didn't go home. And then it talks about how he goes down to the river to process what hap- what's happened. The singer's experiencing life. He's in the backseat of a car with a girl, nervous and anxious. She wasn't ready. He probably wasn't either. And they just went, got food. He dropped her off. And he goes down to the river to process what happened and where his life is going with that. I think we all need those places to think and to process what's happened in our lives. For me, it's long hikes through the woods, long drives down back roads. And it doesn't matter if it's about love or loss, grief or joy. It just matters that we have the place and the space to go and process things, especially places and spaces that matter to us that we've grown up with as part of that. And that doesn't mean that we've grown up with it in terms of our whole lives, but places and spaces that have we have experienced things with. In fact, in fact, I'd love a remake of this song from a person in his mid-40s who's dealing with the changing realities and how that river can still help him figure it out. So this is Alan Jackson's Chattahoochee. And like always, I'll add this to our Rusty Water Towers playlist on Spotify. So now, let's get to know our guest. Welcome, Amber. What's been your experiences, experience of the Chattahoochee? Oh my goodness. I love this song so much. When you sent it to me, I was so excited that you chose. To me, it's like... This is my childhood, and Mm -hmm. maybe if there could be a song about my husband and his youth, this might be it. (laughs) (laughs) Although in the um, in South Dakota, we did not have a river, but I would say uh, the the dirt roads and the main street uh, of our small town and the football field. Um, And I just think, like you're just trying to find fun in the middle of of your boredom in this hot summer day and I just like I feel that so many days um just trying to find something fun and like why not fog up the windows in a car you know and oops (laughs) that won't work so let's go get a burger yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) and um my other connection to this song I wanted to bring up is that I cannot hear the song without seeing music video I spent hours 
of my childhood watching music videos on CMT. And I just think of Alan, no, Alan Jackson, right? It was Alan Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alan Jackson on the water skis with his cowboy hat and that neon, the neon of Life Fest. Mm-hmm. And at the end, he has the guitar on the... Um, the float. The floaty thing. Whatever that's called. I can't even think of it. The, um, the, yeah, the float, which is called it. The inner tube. Inner tube. Yeah, the, yeah. In, the inner tube. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I'm like, that video is so iconic of the 90s and just like those, but, the music videos. And the fun, the fun aspect of, of country. Like yeah, I tend to lean a lot into the sad country, but the fun country is also yes. there. And that kind that watermelon crawl, anything like that that's got a silly yes. aspect to it, but it still mm-hmm. means something. Uh, it's so it's so good. Mm-hmm. Yes. So mm-hmm. I think like to me that the video and the song and um the part where the two teenagers, the girl and the the boy are sitting in front of that old car that that could be me and my husband like (laughs) we he had a he has a 69 Chevelle and we spent just hours driving in that thing so it really is a is a song that that brings back my youth um and I love what you're saying about the uh the place Mm -hmm. the importance of place and stuff so yeah I'd say that's where it brings me to that place of of his old car that he fixed up and spending hours driving country roads. (laughs) Not always fogging up windows, mom, if you're listening. (laughs) (laughs) Not always. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Anyways. (laughs) That's funny. That's funny. So now that we've learned about your uh, apparently youth and all the experiences you had uh, and connected to the song, tell us a little bit more about yourself. I gave your your bio that you gave me, but I want I want to hear yes. about you, how you grew up, wh- where you, where you live, your experience with rural life. Yes. So getting ready for this, I was like, oh boy, I I love rural ministry. I've always been in rural ministry, and um, I've been married to my husband Tyler. Like I was just saying we were high school sweetheart, and we have four kids. Uh, ranging from age 15 to five and we live in this what I call a medium-sized town for South Dakota it's Mm -hmm. about 1500 people Um, but I grew up in a town of 300 so if you want to talk about rural life like (laughs) I don't know it it gets maybe a little bit smaller than that in South Dakota but not a lot Um, Mm -hmm. we had the world's best meat locker where people came to buy German sausage like I our meat locker is so fantastic. So tell the guests what a meat locker is if they're not from that area. Okay, so it's it's a place where people, well, mostly the farmers, come and process their meat. And you can buy a half a cow or just buy, you know, or a whole cow at a time. But our locker was famous for German sausage, which is like sausage just with this particular seasonings. Oh, sounds so delicious. Yes. And so we would have these German sausage feeds yeah. every year that like hundreds and hundreds of people would come to our town to have our uh, sausage. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, that sounds <laughs> terrible. That, <laughs> that might be the title of the episode. People would come for miles and miles to have our sausage. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> okay. I didn't think that one through. That's okay. Um, That's okay. So we move, we're pretty close to that hometown now, but um, currently I serve, like you said, a church uh, in a very another very small town, and it has about forty members. Yeah. And I also do a lot of work with our annual conference. If the listeners are Methodist, you'll know what that means. Annual conference um, is the regional body of uh, of a group of Methodist churches. Yep. Yep. So I do a lot of work with them, and then. Um, you already said that I just finished my master's of divinity, thanks to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm hoping to be uh, commissioned as a provisional deacon this summer. But the other thing that's really important to me that will probably come out in all the things that I'm saying today is that I'm also being certified as a spiritual director. So yes. I'm so passionate about spiritual formation mm-hmm. and um, what that can look like in a rural area. Um, yes. So I, I'm really also like right now with that kind of learning a lot about grief and trauma and mm-hmm. um, particularly in the church. So I've, 
I'm just saying I'm bringing that all into I love the conversation it. I love it. We need, today. We need more work around spiritual care, pastoral care in rural spaces and helping people utilize their rural ways of knowing to do the spiritual work. Yes, because it's different. Mm -hmm. It's different in a rural area. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. To get into those conversations. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I looked it up while you were talking. You grew up in a town of 300. I grew up just outside of a town of 197 people. So I win. Wow. That <laughs> is good. Okay, have, fine. Have, <laughs> have you heard Have you heard the, the song uh, from Hardy called Rednecker? And it goes through this like people trying to one-up each, uh, one each other and how country they are. And they're talking about my town smaller than your town. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't heard that song. But yes, I get that all the time where... Um, People oh. call their town a small town, and I'm like, no, a 25,000 <laughs> is not a small town. Yeah, yes. So. Uh, I do, I, the town I do live within the sea limits of now is just under 2,000. So I, I, we live mm -hmm. in about the same size of town now, uh, again. So, but I serve yes. in an area that's unincorporated. So it's just called Cat Square, North Carolina, or Vale, North Carolina, depending on what part of the county you're in. Mm, okay, yes. Yeah. Kind of like a township. Yeah, it's just a township. It's called the Northbrook Township, and mm -hmm. uh, but they have mm -hmm. little little community areas that we have Vale, Cat Square. Lots of times, it's you know it's, it's a, a a crossroads that where where like a, something's grown up around. There's a restaurant, a gas station, a post office. That's mm -hmm. the situation. Yes, yes, yes. Yep, mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah, in South Dakota, we have a lot of towns like that around elevators, farm elevators. Yes, where, yes. Uh, if people don't know what that is, where you know farmers bring in their crop. Uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's a, stored or yeah. it's sold or put on a train. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so a lot of my, towns are on that. Yeah, so it's, it's a grain elevator. So you can like pull your 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 truck or the train cars will go under it and they'll dump the feed and the grain into it to take to eat to feed, your, usually feed livestock. That's what I'm used to. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of that, especially this year with our drought. It's all pretty much gone to, gone to animal feed this yes. year. So yeah. So yeah, droughts droughts are, are serious work in, in rural areas that you have to deal with. Also, excessive rains are serious yes. work in rural areas because we're experiencing some places around here excessive rain. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, it is. You know that is, you know, it affects the mood. I would almost say it affects the mood of your church, yes. even uh, how the farmers are doing. You know, if they're at the like I was at a football game with some congregation members, and you know there's some rain clouds and you know, he's sitting there hoping and praying this farmer for rain mm -hmm. and everybody else or not everybody else, but most of the people are like, yay, we have this new football field. And he's just hoping that those clouds are produced rain. And I also think it, it affects so much of, uh, of church life of give, I mean, not just giving, but the, like I said, the overall mood, the spirit of the church life. Yes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was even uh, I, uh, on another episode of this podcast, I interviewed uh, Reverend Shay Craig, and she talks about stewardship in rural communities and how you do stewardship and how it's different than, mm -hmm. say, an urban or a suburban setting because of things like crops mm -hmm. and projections and all of those sort of things that you have to deal with. The weather directly affects your church gift, your, your church budget in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. Thanks for sharing a little about yourself and your spiritual direction work. We're going to take a short break and then come back and I'm just going to ask you to share some stories and experiences you've had in rural ministry. So we'll be back after this message. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Hi there, Jonathan here, and I'm recording this ad to tell you about a resource from the Hinton Rural Life Center. My wife, Shannon, and I have partnered with Hinton to create the Theotokos Connections Confirmation Curriculum for small rural churches. We designed this curriculum with rural youth programs in mind where you really want to connect their teenagers with the culture, heritage, and place on top of the faith you're trying to instill through the confirmation program. There are six sessions that focus on topics like connecting to self, God, history, church, place, and creation. Each unit has either a Bible story, like the story of Mary or the story of Samuel, or a historical figure like Richard Allen or Harriet Tubman to engage with as part of the experience. But this experience is not just a sit and listen and do a paperwork kind of confirmation. It's an active and connective confirmation program. You might be headed to a museum, helping prepare for a church spaghetti supper, learning new prayer practices, assisting in worship, or volunteering at the local mission agency. It is designed with rural culture and rural life in mind. You can do this in six weeks, six months, 
and you can do them in most any order or form you want to engage. And I'll tell you, I, I'm pretty sure it's not just youth programs using this curriculum. I've seen other people get it for their college ministries, as well as perhaps using it as adult confirmation or adult refresher on Methodist and rural culture and life. And you know, if you have other trusted confirmation curriculum you want to pair it with, go ahead. This is a very customizable program, so if you want to bring other lessons from a different program you've used or things you've written yourself, feel free to blend them in. This is also a very affordable program and you pay per student, not for a lump sum curriculum that you may not use all the pieces of, or you may not use but once every two or three years. And this is designed to make it affordable and accessible for you. And it pairs well with Hinton's Theotokos confirmation retreats that happen in the spring. For more information on the curriculum or to place an order, check out hintoncenter.org slash Theotokos or hintontheotokos.org for more information. Thanks. Oh, 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 oh. Welcome back. Uh, so, Amber, each, each episode I ask people to share stories, experiences, images that they have of rural life that where they're finding hope, where they're seeing faith grow, all sorts of things like that. So I'm just going to let you take it away. I know you've got some great stories, so go for it. Yes. Okay. So the first story that that came to mind that I think is just shows the epitome of ministry and mm -hmm. rural life. I was just starting my MDiv and I was asked to fill in for this very small church, like mm -hmm. 10 to 20 people a Sunday. And um, I preached a few times and they asked me to be their interim. And I, this was without any experience, like literally months after I decided to even start my MDiv and maybe become a pastor wow. someday. So, okay. So I am there and it's maybe like a month in and we showed up one day and I could tell something was going on. There was some action in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I don't even want to get out of my car. I can tell it's not, there's a bad situation, but I got out and this 90 year old man was unresponsive in his car. Members had already called the ambulance and then they, they, the ambulance members showed up. And of course, half of them are members of our mm -hmm. congregation, yeah. right? So members of the congregation are EMTs and they're coming to pick up this man that they love. And I had never been in any kind of emergency situation wow. ever. And I wasn't trained as a pastor to handle yeah. an emergency situation yet. <laughs> so I did all that I knew that I could do and that the spirit led me to do. And so I held his wife and I just prayed over mm -hmm. her and um, just prayed and prayed and prayed. And so they took him away and this was before worship started. And I was like, how am I going to carry on with worship with people who are starting to grieve because we're really thinking he's not going to live. And I thought, you know, this man, he's ready mm -hmm. to be with Jesus. He's, he's not going to fight fight death you know um and also as I was preparing for worship I was thinking I'll be planning a funeral this week I don't I haven't even been to a funeral in a long time I don't know how to lead a funeral and so everybody's worked up um and he had so actually on the way to the um hospital he woke up and was wondering why he was there and his test came out fine and I and I got it was just when we were ready to start worship that I got the text that he oh. was okay. But I still was like, there's this chaos happening in the mm -hmm. congregation, right? We're all worked up. Um, so I ended up starting worship and I said, you know, I just want to stop right now. We are all, we're all upset. Most of us were here and witnessed what happened. We saw him unresponsive. So we're just going to take a few minutes of worship just to acknowledge that we're sad and that we're feeling stirred up. And, um, mm. and so I thought I, and I said, we all worked together in that situation to take care of him and to do what's right, you know? And yeah. that to me, that I tell the story because this is the hope in rural ministry is the way that people are come together in times of need. So I stopped and I said, we're going to do this breath prayer and I taught them this prayer that I knew to mm -hmm. take deep breaths as you um, breathe in and out and you think of this square if you want to know more I would love to tell anybody about it mm -hmm. 
the added extra fun of this story of real life is that my friend mm-hmm. Rodney Knock, that you you know Rodney yes. Knock as well, he was at a church nearby. And a few days later, he told me that, of course, his congregation knew what was happening, that this man was mm-hmm. probably dead. And they were feeling so bad for me because I was so new and didn't know what, this is his congregation feeling bad for me (laughs) to do a funeral. I'm Mm -hmm. so new. And then by the end of their service too, they had heard that he was alive. So then they're like that pastor at at Stickney, she's raising people to life. Yes. (laughs) So it was like, I had performed a miracle that day. That that is fabulous. (laughs) And it was just a joke. (laughs) Yeah, and I just thought, like, really, like the the point, the fact that it got to the next town over, and that congregation was already feeling bad for me, and like feeling for me, my people were mm-hmm. were worked up, you know. And I just think like that that connectionalism that we have, and and also that the church came together to to support. Uh, it's just it gives me so much hope. I think oh, that is beautiful, and it's also an example of how news will trap ripple fast through rural communities. Like he 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 hadn't even gotten to the oh, yes. hospital yet, and your other other churches they did. already. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't even know how that works. If it's scanners, um, <laughs> some people have scanners going. Maybe there's EMT members at that next town over, but um, you're just like, I don't even know how does how does the word get around so fast. It's <laughs> yeah, scanners, text messages, Facebook, we have no idea, but it made it it made, it made its way. Uh, that's that's a, yes. so much there is that you were able to you know like you knew your boundaries that you couldn't you were not going to be the person who was going to be able to perform emergency practices, but you could be with that person's yes. family, pray with them and pray over the situation and keep them calm, and then you were able to take the congregation and to lead them through a calming spiritual practice that helped them recenter mm-hmm. themselves and get help dissipate some at least some of the anxiety of the reality of what happened. And and now you you yes. know it's it's within like your first, you know, couple months at this church and there's just now other churches know that you're magic. <laughs> <laughs> I can bring people to life and calm you down with breath prayer. <laughs> yes. That you need to put that. So, you, need, you need to put that description in your spiritual director like profile wherever you put those. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh yeah, it was good, and it's like it's always kind of a fun story to tell um, mm-hmm. that I could that I brought a man back to life, but it, we know that's not true. But um, but he it was yeah. But at least your prayers were able to help people focus in the midst of not knowing if he was alive or not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like in that story too, I think it's just, and I do this all the time. Like when we're, things are stirred up because we're not, our technology is not working. I've fumbled over parts of worship or whatever. Like a lot of times I still stop and say, okay, you know what? We're going to stop right now and we're going to pray. Or I just like stop and let's just take a minute of just silence. And so I try to do that all the time because I also feel mm-hmm. like it's important for people to know that I'm not perfect. Yeah. There's things all the time that get in the way, but we can come back uh-huh. to the reason to Jesus. Oh, um, and that's so true and so good. And it's that reminder that worship is not a production for spectators, but an experience yes. of us being together. And rural churches, I feel like get mm-hmm. that because they'll just start talking during the service whenever somebody needs to say something sometimes. And even as the mm-hmm. pastor, you need to we need to remind ourselves of that, that sometimes you're not the person who's going to be talking the whole time and it's just going to happen yes, and you don't, yeah. you don't plan for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think so too. So that's, that's been, you know, something that I took with me from that experience of just like, it's okay to stop. And yeah, I think the more rural churches I'm in, I realize like they're just so flexible and mm-hmm. they're just, they're excited to be there for worship. And they're so glad that there's a pastor there that wants to come share a message. Um, yes, yes. And so they're so flexible in that way. Um, so it's so great. It's so great. So you said you had more than one story. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm looking forward to what's yes. next. Okay. So I'm, this is, this gets me so excited too, because when I was a kid, I lived in a, in another uh, small town in South Dakota. I mentioned the one that was 300, but this was maybe a little bit bigger. And it was part of, of a Native American reservation. Oh. 
yeah and so we just had the very best pastor um she was so full of life and love and she just was the best at community outreach um she did a lot of amazing things and programs uh and just saying fun things for people to come to as my i remember as a kid she probably did serious things too but i remember (laughs) yeah i mean it's the reality you remember what touched you no matter what time of your life it is Yes. But the one thing that I think about all the time is that she was able to convince all the local churches to hold a community VBS, Vacation Bible School. Great, great. Lutherans, Lutherans, Catholics, Presbyterians, all the things. And some of these denominations don't ever come together with anyone, but it was, it was everyone. And so as an adult, I realized that was so amazing that Mm -hmm. she first of all convinced all those churches and pastors to get on board. So the next part of it was that she always dreamed big. One year, the theme of the Bible school was something to do with like nature and like taking care of our planet. And so she got, she got this idea that we should get this huge grain bin yeah. That she knew somebody had that was painted with a seven up logo. Yes. She put she put it in the yard of the church, like right outside the front door. Perfect. Um, during DVS. And so the goal was that week to collect as many cans as possible to recycle and then to donate the money from the aluminum uh, to a cause. I don't remember what cause it was, but every day she or somebody else would get up on a ladder and literally pour in all these cans. I mean, I can still see this bright green. (laughs) I think it was a green bin sitting on the lawn of our church. Mm. And then another year, this theme was animals. Mm -hmm. And she was like, what kind of big animal can we get on this church lawn? Not a live one. (laughs) We did have live. We did have live animals too, but, but what she ended up getting was (laughs) was <laughs> a Budweiser horse. Like a big Clydesdale was, type horse? A Clydes, yes. And it was like, I think meant for parades because it was on this kind of block that had wheels. Oh, so and it's easy so, to move at least so they can get it there. Yes, yes. And so we had this enormous <laughs> Budweiser <laughs> horse on our front lawn because we needed to have an animal. Mm-hmm. We needed to have some kind of big visual thing. And of course, she or somebody else like covered up the Budweiser. Um, you should have just sold, sold ad space to Budweiser and see if you could have made money for your <laughs> church that way. Yeah. Okay. And so it was just like, if she, I don't know if she got any grief for, from anyone. I'm sure she had had to for having yeah. Budweiser horses. But I just think I remember that she just like went all out. Nice. And she just dreamed big to make this, to make VBS so incredible for all the kids in town Mm -hmm. and I mean we went to all the different churches they all played a part and it just was um it was such an incredible experience um and there's a lot that I remember from that church but I think too um as I keep going to me one of the things that's most exciting uh to go with this is uh in rural life is these community events Mm -hmm. um I've lived in small towns, you know, my entire life. But one of the things that gives me the most hope is this, these things of communities coming together to do great things like this VBS. Um, last summer in the town I was serving, we had about 100 kids come to our VBS in a town wow. of like 1,300. And I saw the people from every congregation coming together to use their gifts to provide this experience for our kids in town. Um, So like the older generation, one church, they're like, you know, we don't have volunteers to work with the kids. We don't have youth, but what we want to do is provide snacks. So they provided snacks for the kids and they provided snacks for the volunteers. We had adults, you know, older adults teaching crafts and teaching kids to bake. We had our youth groups. Yeah, our youth groups were, you know, there Uh to keep the kids under control, but they did such a fantastic job and they loved it too. Mm -hmm. And then us us pastors each took a day to lead a Bible story. Um, And yeah, it was just like we talked about it. 
yeah, we talked about it ministerially. We said in this time of such divisiveness mm -hmm. to for people in our congregations to see us come together mm -hmm. to do this and get along is so important. So we did the VBS, but we also held some community worship services that were also just a hit. And when we right. did them, everybody just loved it, you know? And so I think in the, in our small towns, um, what I thought about, what I think about often is that a lot of times we get in our own church and we're so overwhelmed by, mm -hmm. okay, I got to have a youth group. We've got to have this kind of supper and this, and we're all working so hard, but uh -huh. can we come together for youth group? Yes. Can we come together for VBS and share mm -hmm. our resources, share our people, share our financial mm -hmm. And not even just like we think a lot of times with kids activities, but we could do that for senior citizen yes. activities, singles ministries, yes. so many there are, you know, gardening ministries, mission trips, all of these sort of things. Mm -hmm. Not every church, not every church needs to have all of these things. But between, you know, how many yes. churches in your town, whether there's five churches or 50, you could work together to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that time, too, there was a, we had a lot of suicide ah. um, in a year. Unfortunately, so somebody, you know, there was a suicide um, support group that, you know, oh. we all promoted. And so I think and grief and just like, yeah, oh, yes. we can do those as a community. We don't have to be in competition or you know, I, I have several colleagues working on things like grief share and mental health first aid in their communities and uh, mm -hmm. suicide support group. Uh, make see which church can host the AA group or the celebrate recovery group, because it doesn't have to be at my yes. church to be a ministry we support as part of mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and it's so beautiful when when it comes together people from all the congregation yeah um i just hate to see it when it becomes a competition i've seen great things uh when communities come together and i and i often think you said community events and i wasn't even thinking about church events i was saying like the christmas parade or the tractor pull or the the town mm -hmm. festival those sort of things and churches can play a big role in that because most of your church members are going to go or are going to be part of it in some way yes. anyway mm -hmm. so find ways for your church to be involved your church doesn't even have to have a booth just be present and helpful <laughs> as part of it that yes that's true because uh -huh. sometimes you don't have the resources to mm -hmm do the thing or mm -hmm. make the parade float, you know? You know, but you could hand so. out candy or like maybe the parade runs right by your church. So just put out chairs so people don't have to bring chairs. And First Newton, they, a lot of times during parades and festivals, they have a bathroom ministry because there's not a lot of public restrooms in town. So mm -hmm. they're just like, we have a, we have somebody here with bottled water and some snacks in the bathrooms. Um, and that's mm -hmm. easy. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Because uh -huh. I, I just think, for some of those people who have never been in a church if they start thinking about church uh -huh. they know they've used your bathroom yeah. and they know what it looks like inside the church mm -hmm. and like that's huge all right because you already have a uh -huh. point of connection and a point of welcome and yeah. i think it's they will they will think of that mm -hmm. <laughs> so i think we think it's got to be some big huge event or Mm -hmm. something that takes a lot of things but you're right it can be as simple as you can use our bathrooms mm -hmm. you know yeah you can use our bathroom here's some water and some pack of crackers yeah here's a, here's a trash can that's perfect <laughs> it's just, thanks so much amber for sharing those stories those and and you know i talk a lot during these interviews too because i i feel like it's a conversation between us about our rural ministry experience but now since at the beginning of this episode i brought in some music to talk about i always ask my guest to bring in some media. I don't care if it's books, music, TV shows, video games, uh, what, whatever is giving you hope right now that we might be able to share with our listeners. I, I want you to share that with us. Okay, awesome. So I I love media probably way too much. So you just <laughs> have to stop me. <laughs> um, but when you talked about music, one of the bands I've been listening to um, so I'm an Enneagram for like, I love moody music that makes me feel things. And yes. one of so the, we're gonna pause one of the you're, things, you're, you need to share what the Enneagram is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I love the Enneagram and that's kind of a, a personality typing, but it's much deeper than that. It has to go, go with kind of our childhood wounds and this just deep. Yes, it's based on our experiences as children and youth. Yes. It's, uh, I'm an Enneagram yes. 7. I am considered the enthusiast. Yes, so I'm an Enneagram 4, the romantic. 
Oh, and yes. so I, I feel things and I feel things big. And so um, I have was introduced to this band and I kind of heard their music off and on, but it's called Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors. And I'm familiar. Probably yes. lots of people are like, yeah, yeah. I've been listening to yeah. him for years. <laughs> well, you know, whenever but, you find music, that's the right time for you to find music. I don't care if you've just discovered Travis Tritt today or you listen to him in the 90s. If you like his music, yes. you like his music. Yes. And so there's, when I turn on my Alexa um, mm -hmm. around supper time, I love to listen to Drew Hulk and the Neighbors and mm -hmm. that station, that station. If you ask Alexa to play, it's a great station because um, uh -huh. it makes me feel things when I'm sitting down at the table with my family. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, I don't know. So that's just been good for my soul. But mm -hmm. Do you one have some of songs? the... Yes. Some songs. Oh gosh. Yeah. So Amber's going to send me some music and I'm going to put that in our playlist just because I don't, I can't yes. just drop all of his music into the playlist. So we're. No, we'll, I, yeah, I'll send you my favorite songs. Okay, good. Send me three or four songs and I'll drop those in the playlist too. Awesome. Okay. All right. Then the next thing that I always tell people about when I get the chance uh -huh. is that I love Kate Bowler's podcasts. I love her books. Uh -huh. um her her podcast is called everything happens yeah and I, um it is phenomenal and you have to know that as me as this person who's very um into spiritual life and grief mm -hmm. and trauma as i said um her podcast is a lot about that um but i think she has this gift of making our ordinary everyday things beautiful and holy mm -hmm. And I think um, she helps me as a flawed individual just feel feel okay with feeling lots of things at one time. Um, life oh, is tragic lovely. and it's beautiful. One day she had this guy who was a funeral director. She had on uh, this couple where the husband has to take care of his wife um, because she had a stroke when she was in her 20s, um, mm -hmm. Catherine and Jay Wolf. And... Um, the most beautiful, I mean, I cried listening to that podcast because they said something like, even if you're broken, you're still worthy of love. And mm -hmm. it's just messages like that, that you, you just, or I just need. And so I just think it's a phenomenal, like finding beauty, finding holy in the ordinary. Um, mm -hmm. So I yes. love that. So thank you. I'll put the podcast on the show notes here and I'll put a couple of her books in our virtual bookshelves for you to bookshelves for you to find. Uh, so mm -hmm. any, anything else you want to share with the listeners? Where can people reach you? Yes. Well, I have a fun um, show on Facebook called A Cup of Joy with Amber. And I'll, mm -hmm. I think I sent you the link. Yes, but... I've been on that show. Yes, it's fun. It's really like... <laughs> It's really just for fun. The editing yeah. is terrible and there is no editing, but um, <laughs> I just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just to, it's just to bring people joy. Yeah. And maybe some laughter in their, uh -huh. in their week. So um, it's so not, need yeah, to it's on just Facebook fun. And go listen to that. You can find me rambling about country music on there too. It's kind of my yes. MO whenever I'm on somebody, I'm like, you need to listen to this music and here's my favorite music. <laughs> And all of this sort of stuff. Yes, I know. I feel like Jonathan, we could have an entire couple of hour show talking about nineties country and all of that. I, I mean, modern country is fine, but I just really think you can't compete with that. Now, maybe I have an episode you on argue? here where it's not where it's a nineties country spectacular, and we just we just like talk about like 10 90s songs. Maybe I'll have you back in the future. Yes. Would you <laughs> argue though that you think like Merle Haggard and those guys are better? So I, I follow the music of, of the understandings of Grady Smith, and I am not here to gatekeep what you think is good country music. If you like, True. I think, I think, so I've been listening to a lot of uh, older country music because I'm doing on, on my website a sort of a spiritual reflection on each of uh, Rolling Stone's 100 greatest country albums of all time. And sometimes mm. it's Kenny Chesney, but then I'm listening to Ernest Tubb right now and just this, this 1950s feel to him. So I think they're both mm -hmm. beautiful and they both have a value. And you can, I can see that them both being country for people who like country music uh, as, as yes. part of that. But then I'll also argue that Lil Nas X is country. So it's, it's in, in ways, just based <laughs> on some of his themes and even some of the way he sings and raps. It's so, yeah. it's so important. So yeah, I would say 90s 
it was sort of a very particular time in country music where it had sort of a renaissance yes. of of it getting hit, get, hitting mainstream success again. That's where you had Faith Hill, Shania Twain, all of them doing their mm -hmm. big pop crossovers uh, as parts of that, and that sort of yes. revitalization of country as something that has something to say. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know. yes. Good stuff. Yes. Okay. So, so stay tuned, guys. Amber may be back for a '90s country spectacular in the future. Uh, so, as we talk about that, I'm going to close out the show. Uh, thanks, Amber, again for being here. Check out her. Uh, check out her show, A Cup of Joy with Amber, on Facebook. Uh, it's a great little program. So, uh, thanks so much, Amber, for being here on Rusty Water Towers. You can listen to Rusty Water Towers wherever you get your podcasts. If you have questions, suggestions for topics or guests, or just want to say hi. Reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, for however long Twitter, Twitter is still around, and email us at rustywatertowers at gmail.com. Special thanks to my wife, Shannon Lamastersmith, for our theme music titled Hildebrand. And I record this podcast with the, with the hope that we can find the life uh, anew in rural communities. So thanks for listening. Live across the railroad tracks in a little lighthouse. Must you pass if you weren't trying to find me? Many of the trees are dead, there's stumps in the ground. In a great big yard, across from the fire station.